Welcome. Today, Pastor Bartley is teaching from our new series, Lessons from a Global Disaster. And there's lots happening to tell you about in the life of Renew Church. Uh, as a reminder, Maverick Youth, which is grades 6 to 12, they meet Tuesday evenings at St. Jude's Academy. So please go onto the website, go onto the Church Center app to get all of the details and to register for that. We also have a young adult group called Society. They meet Thursday evenings. And we also have Renew Groups, which are smaller groups in local communities um, throughout our area. They focus on Bible study, praying for each other, uh, and so much more. Uh, it's a really core part of the life of our church. So please hunt me down, denise at renewchurch.ca, or definitely fill in the Connect card on the Church Center app or on the website to find out more about these things and get connected. Uh, to keep up with all these events, I keep talking about this Church Center app. There should magically be a QR code on your screen now. Scan that QR code, like right now. If you do not have the Church Center app yet, scan that code, download the app, because there is so much information about what's going on in the life of the church, uh, church directory, events, groups, and then even things like bonus pro tips like we did in the last series show up there. Uh, so you don't want to miss out. Get that downloaded now. While you're doing that, let me just tell you about next week, that Man Called Jesus for Kids is starting. This is a six-week series. It happens during the service at Hope Church, uh, led by Elder Barry Jones. Uh, we have a number of kids signed up for this already. Uh, it's actually the adult curriculum, so it's a really good, serious study on the life of Jesus through the eyes of the disciple John. Uh, and it's a great foundational stepping stone if your children are interested in baptism. So reach out to me about that if you are still looking to sign up. Uh, by the way, Renew Group leaders, uh, I think most of you have seen the notification. We have a quick meeting right after service next week here at Hope Church. Child care is being provided. We are also looking forward to celebrating Easter together. So to let you know what's happening on Good Friday, these Renew Groups that we're talking about, you want to be plugged into a Renew Group, are having love feasts with threefold communion. That's what we're looking forward to on Good Friday. And on Sunday, Easter Sunday, there is a family service followed by a back to life barbecue bash. That sounds amazing, doesn't it? You're gonna keep hearing about that over the coming weeks. So that's what's happening in the life of the church. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for always being with us, for never changing, for being there whether the waters are smooth or rough. You are always by our side, accessible. If we draw close to you, your promises are enduring. Lord, we thank you that your word from thousands of years ago still will always hold truth for us today. And we look forward to learning from that today. In Jesus' name, amen.
king All the dead are coming back to life I'm back to life Hear the song awaken All creation singing We're alive Cause you're alive You call me out of the blue You call me into the light You call my name And then my heart came alive Church, just before we jump into our sermon, we're going to take a moment to read from Scripture. And so today we're reading from Genesis chapter 7, verse 24, to chapter 8, verse 17. And this is what it says. The waters flooded the earth for 150 days, but God remembered Noah and all the wild animals and the livestock that were with him in the ark. And he sent a wind over the earth and the waters receded. Now the spring of the deep and the floodgates of the heavens had been closed and the rain had stopped falling from the sky. The water receded steadily from the earth. At the end of the 150 days, the water had gone down and on the 17th day of the seventh month, the ark came to rest on the mountains of Ararat. The waters continued to recede until the 10th month and on the first day of the 10th month, the tops of the mountains became visible. After 40 days, Noah opened a window he had made in the ark and sent out a raven and it kept flying back and forth until the water had dried up from the earth. Then he sent out a dove to see if the water had receded from the surface of the ground. But the dove could find nowhere to perch because there was water over all the surface of the earth. So it returned to Noah in the ark. He reached out his hand and took the dove and brought it back to himself in the ark. He waited seven more days and again sent out the dove from the ark. When the dove returned to him in the evening, there in its beak was a freshly plucked olive leaf. Then Noah knew that the water had receded from the earth. He waited seven more days and sent the dove out again, but this time it did not return to him. By the first day of the first month of Noah's 601st year, the water had dried up from the earth. Noah then removed the covering from the ark and saw that the surface of the ground was dry. By the 27th day of the second month, the earth was completely dry. Then God said to Noah, Come out of the ark, you and your wife, and your sons and their wives. Bring out every kind of living creature that is with you, the birds, the animals, and all the creatures that move along the ground so they can multiply on the earth and be fruitful and increase in number on it.
Welcome to Reunion Sunday, everybody. It is good to see you today, and it has been so good seeing everybody showing up at Hope Church every weekend, more and more people every weekend. This week is actually the last week that we're going to have to sing through masks. Yes, the mask mandate ends tomorrow, so our hope is that people are going to come out even more to our Sunday services in person at Hope Church. I just want to say it straight up, we have missed seeing you. We've really missed you. You know, this two-year pandemic will be a defining moment for our entire generation. It is something that we're going to talk to our grandkids about. You know, two years is a long time to be in the sort of lockdown that we've been in. I remember many of us had plans for March break back in 2020. Do you remember that? We had no idea what we were headed into. And so we canceled our plans. We watched the grocery store shelves empty. Uh, we shut down all of our sports and our community activities, the restaurants closed, uh, church services went online. People who could, they started working from home. Many others had to stop work altogether. Life basically went on hold. We just pressed the pause button on life. We missed birthdays and graduations and retirement parties. Childhood wedding dreams had to be completely reimagined because there just weren't, we weren't allowed to have very many people at those ceremonies. We agonized as our loved ones were in nursing homes and hospitals, and we were not allowed to go and visit them. Businesses that took a lifetime to build, all of the blood, sweat, and tears that went into those, those businesses were decimated, many of them within weeks. Teenagers that were ready to start driving a car for the first time had to wait and couldn't go and do their driving test. Kindergarten students came to see masks as just being normal because that's what they started with in school, while many other students missed out on two full years of social interaction with their peers. You know, just last week, my son Joseph confided to me that uh, he feels like he's missed a part of his childhood as a result of COVID. You know, I still keep in touch with my high school friends today, but I wonder how many students my son's age never got to develop those relationships enough over the last couple of years to see that happen. And I just think, what a tragedy that is. My older son, Jacob, graduated from Sheridan College only to have them send him a box in the mail with his diploma and his graduation cap in it. woo right? Like, that is what it's been like. People have been isolated from their workmates. We've been unable to visit loved ones who live in other provinces or other countries. Mental health has taken a, ser a serious hit on the general population. And you know what? Some of us have even buried family members, sometimes without the ability to have a proper funeral over these last two years. Guys, here at Renew, we took the time to mourn some of these losses that I just finished describing. And we've really done our best to try to stay connected over the last two years. But now, as we finally emerge from this pandemic, we're eager to get back to life as we once knew it. But here's the thing. We all kind of know in our gut that things are never going to quite be the same. The landscape has really just totally shifted. The way that we do work has changed. The places where we do work has changed. The way that we get our education the way that we communicate with each other, the financial impact, I mean, whether it's personally or nationally or even globally, that whole landscape has shifted. And it's shifted as well for our church and for many other churches out there. Guys, you know, as Christians, we, we look to the Bible for answers in every area of our life. Sometimes it's very specific information that we look to the Bible for, like what's right and what's wrong. But sometimes we're looking for just kind of more general direction for our lives. Like, how do I make sense of a seemingly meaningless life? Or like, we, we look to the book of Ecclesiastes for that. Or how do I just grow in general wisdom? The book of Proverbs is good for that. And so we have different places that we look for this information. Many of us have probably never thought that the Bible would have much to offer who, uh, to people who are coming out of a global pandemic. But I'm actually here to tell you today that the Bible does give us some great information about this sort of a dynamic. 
It's not in specific commands or formulas, but really more in patterns and principles that we can take from one story and apply to our story. You see, in the Bible, it teaches that somewhere around 4,500 years ago, the world went through an even bigger catastrophe. And we know that as being the flood, this global flood that took place. The Bible presents the flood as a factual historical event. Now, interest, interestingly enough, there are over 200 flood myths from virtually every culture in the world that are around out there. You can check into these things that bear a striking, striking resemblance to the flood account found in the book of Genesis that we read in our Bible. Many Christian scientists see the flood account as meshing very neatly with what we see in the geological record as well as in the fossil record. I was actually at the Grand Canyon just this past summer, and I can tell you, it is pretty obvious that a whole bunch of water went rushing through the western prairies all at once. Secular scientists, of course, have had an agenda for years to discredit the biblical account, so you're rarely going to hear them give any credence to the Genesis flood account. But you should know that our church takes the Bible at face value. We take it very seriously, and we believe in a historical flood. According to Genesis chapter 6 to 9, God saw the wickedness of mankind and he decided to destroy the world with a flood and to start over again with eight people. Noah and his wife, Noah's three sons and their wives. So eight people. And from the day that the rain started falling until the day that his family exited the ark, it was actually just over a year, 370 days. You can calculate it by all of the uh, different markers that are given to us in that story. Now, you've likely learned about Noah and the flood in Sunday school or read, you know, books to your children, cute little books with pictures of giraffes and elephants on the deck of the ark. But what you probably didn't learn was how dramatically the flood actually changed life on planet Earth. I actually have a little article here uh, that comes from the website Answers in Genesis. This is an article called Post-Flood World, a creationist perspective. Just... So you can kind of get an idea of what the world may have been like as they exited the ark. Just take a listen to this. After the flood, Noah stepped into a forbidding world. The animals and plants from the previous world were dead and buried under thousands of feet of sand and mud. New plants were struggling to reestablish themselves across the barren expanse of earth. Meanwhile, the earth remained unstable. Its bell had been rung and it would take centuries to quiet down. Supervolcanoes belched ash and death over vast regions, and superquakes rocked the earth. Somehow, the earth's climate had to transition from the warmest, wettest period in history to the moderate weather we expect today. But it was a rocky transition. The volcanic activity during the flood had left the oceans very warm, an average of 30 degrees Celsius, in contrast with the 4 degrees Celsius that we have today. Warm oceans next to cold, barren continents was a rest... uh, Barren continents uh, was a recipe for violent storms. In the years after the flood, hypercanes, similar to Jupiter's great red spot, persisted for decades. These storms drew water from the oceans and rapidly dumped it onto the land. The water quickly filled the depressions in the continents, and these temporary lakes burst through their barriers, cutting deep canyons in their wake. The intense rain saturated the newly laid sediments, allowing groundwater to blast miles of caves in days. As the oceans cooled, precipitation declined, and many of the world's forests dried and converted to grasslands. When the earth had cooled sufficiently, precipitation began to fall as snow and ice, especially in the world's mountain ranges, Antarctica and and northeastern North America. The ice built up rapidly, sometimes miles thick. In North America, the ice eventually surged under its own weight, spreading out and scraping the earth's surface, and then it melted suddenly. As the ocean cooling hypercanes dissipated, the pattern of air circulation changed for the entire planet. With this shift, deserts formed in belts around the world, around 30 degrees north and south of the equator. As the animals left the ark, they rapidly multiplied and spread over the earth. Within just a few years, animals had reached every continent, including Antarctica, which was still warm. Many animals, such as tortoises, traveled on huge mats of floating logs that circled the earth's oceans, for centuries following the flood. God preserved every kind of land animal and bird on Noah's ark. Descendants of the original pairs ended up on different continents, thousands of miles apart. 
Even today, these diverse descendants can still breed with each other. For example, the descendants of the first cats can still breed, cougars with leopards, lions with tigers, and wild cats with domestic cats. Each kind of plant and animal had the capacity to produce offspring with different designs to suit them for different environments. We, this, we see the same capacity in modern dog breeds, such as the Alaskan Malamutes that can sled at the poles while Persian greyhounds can hunt in the hot deserts. None of that variety was put there by humans. This information was there, all there right from the start. As life refilled the earth after the flood, continuing catastrophes buried snapshots of the fleeting environments that rose and fell. The fossil record shows some of the striking variety among the descendants of the animals that left Noah's Ark. For instance, we find fossils of more than 150 different species that arose within two centuries after the first horses left Noah's Ark. Modern descendants of the first horses include zebras, donkeys, and stallions. These fossils remind us of the wisdom of the Creator who programmed a way for complex ecosystems to be reconstructed worldwide in a very short time after the flood. Well, life after the flood, guys, was completely different. And that's what I want you to see from that reading. The climate was drastically impacted. You know, many creation scientists believe that, this, that it was during the flood that the continents actually separated and the Earth's plates eventually crashed into each other to form the great mountain ranges that we see today. Trees had been wiped out. In fact, if you do your research, this is interesting, you'll see that the Earth's oldest trees, do you know how old they date? Right around 4,500 years. It's pretty interesting. Well, there's a lot of room for investigation and discovery, but the thing that I want you to understand here today is that exiting the ark for Noah and his family, it was no party as we sometimes imagine. There were no people left, no trees, no land animals except the animals that came with them, with them on the ark. The land was destroyed. There were no towns to go to. There was no agriculture. There were no cattle. If the creation scientists I read from are right, the climate was very hostile and actually unstable. Like we said, there are super volcanoes and extreme humidity resulting in hypercanes that are blowing around. Life was never going to be the same again. You know, while I was on vacation last week, I read Malcolm Gladwell's book, The Bomber Mafia. Uh, it's a great book about the bombing strategies that were used in World Wars I and II. And uh, if you like, you know, sort of historical records like this, you'll enjoy this book. But it reminded me that leaving the ark, you know what, it, it would have been very similar to visiting Hiroshima after the atomic bomb was dropped on it. I mean, guys, leaving that ark, it would have been disturbing. It would have been terrifying. But there are a handful of important lessons that we can really learn from this global disaster, and particularly as it relates to how we continue to live after this disaster has ended. And that's what I want to do over these next four weeks. I want to discuss one lesson in detail each week that we can talk about. And the first lesson for this first week is this, exit the ark. And so let's start here by reading just a few verses. I'll pick it up where Jake left off reading today. Let's pick it up at verse 13, back up a little bit. It says, by the first day of the first month of Noah's 601st year, the water had dried up from the earth, Noah then removed the covering from the ark and saw that the surface of the ground was dry. By the 27th day of the second month, the earth was completely dry. Then God said to Noah, come out of the ark, you and your wife and your sons and their wives. Bring out every kind of living creature that is with you, the birds, the animals, and all the creatures that move along the ground so they can multiply on the earth and be fruitful and increase in number upon it. So Noah came out together with his sons and his wife and his sons' wives. All the animals and the creatures that move along the ground and all the birds, everything that moves on the earth came out of the ark, one kind after another. Well, I want to focus in on verse 15 that we just saw there in that section, where it says, Then God said to Noah, Come out of the ark. Now, I can see that it would be very easy to read this passage and to read these chapters here in Genesis and just kind of read right over these words without giving them much thought. But I want to tell you guys today, these words are very, very significant. Come out of the ark. You know, the whole question over 
when to leave the ark was the main topic of discussion amongst Noah's family for probably around five months. Just by way of a timeline so you can understand how things happen. Take a look. Here are the days that accumulated and then the event. So after 40 days, the rain stopped. After 150 days, the water reached its highest level. Then after 224 days, they started to see the tops of the mountains. The water began to recede. After 264 days, Noah sends out a raven. After a week later, he sends out a dove. The dove returns, meaning that there's no land that it can settle on. Another week later, he sends out another dove. This time it returns with an olive branch in its mouth. Then a little bit later, Noah sends out the dove and it doesn't return. And then Noah removes the cover from the ark. And Noah and his family finally exit the ark 370 days after they entered the ark. So from the time that they could see the mountaintops until they exit the ark is over five months. And so they had been talking about leaving this ark for some time. I think Noah and his family could relate very well to our anticipation of COVID mandates being lifted. You see the parallel that I'm making here. Just like us, they wanted to know when it was going to be safe to come out again and to resume life again. But I can't help but think that they were not completely eager to leave the boat. See, they had removed the covering, however that was on the ark. They removed that covering. They could look out. They could see the land. And I think what they saw was probably pretty disturbing. Like I said before, everything had changed, and they knew it. See, unlike us, they had nothing to return to. It was all gone. And I imagine that this ark that had become a home for over a year now was now feeling like the safest place to be, despite all of the really nasty animal smells that would have been on that boat. So God actually has to tell Noah and his family, Noah, exit the ark. You know, this theme of leaving the place of safety and comfort in favor of freedom and possibility, I want you to understand today, this is a huge, huge theme in the Bible. Have you ever considered this? Let me give you a few examples. Genesis chapter 2, verse 24, talks about the fact that a man and a woman should leave their parents to start their own family. It says that is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. You see, staying at home with mom and dad, you know what? It's safe, right? Sometimes young people like that, but God's intent is that people grow up and that they head out on their own. They start their own family. Safety is not as high a value for God as freedom and adventure and, get this, mission, the purpose that you're living for. You know, another example would be the scattering of the nations at the Tower of Babel. If you go to Genesis chapter 11, you see that story. Since the time of Noah, the world had one language. And just a couple of centuries after the flood in the plain of Shinar, people settled with the intent of building a city and settling down. And they start building this tower up to the heavens. But in Genesis 11, we see that God said, no, that's not how it's going to work. You're not just going to settle here. And he confused their languages. And at the Tower of Babel, he scattered them over the face of the earth. God had given them the mandate of multiplying and filling the earth, and they were not following that mission. So God said, nope, psh, I'm going to change that. We could talk about Abram leaving the Ur of the Chaldeans to go to Canaan, right? We see in Genesis 12, 1, the Lord said to Abram, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land that I will show you. God told Abram to leave his country and people behind. He didn't even know where he was going, it says, as you read that verse, go to the land that I will show you. We could talk about Israel leaving Egypt when the children of Israel were receiving manna from God every day, which is a literal miracle. Think about that. Bread falling down like dew from heaven every day. What did they do? They whined and they complained that it was boring, right? They wanted meat. And in Numbers chapter 11, look at what it says. It says, the rabble with them began to crave other food. And again, the Israelites started wailing and said, if only we had meat to eat. We remember the fish we ate in Egypt at no cost. Also the cucumbers, melons, leeks, onions, and garlic. Guys, this is so hilarious. I love the phrase here where it says, at no cost. Guys, they were slaves. <laughs> they were slaves in Egypt. But somehow their memory is failing them. And they're thinking about all of the stuff that we had free at no cost. Guys, never forget this. 
even a place of bondage can become a place of comfort. And you don't want that happening. You don't want to become comfortable in this place of bondage thinking this is good. Conservative commentator Dennis Prager says that people, uh, to their own detriment, will routinely choose security over freedom. And I don't agree with everything that Dennis Prager says, but I think that he's right on this one. You know, security is not an ideal to live for. It really isn't, guys. We miss out on our life and our purpose, you know, when we choose security over freedom. Well, we could talk about Jesus leaving heaven, right? Talk about freedom over safety. Jesus leaving the beauty and comfort of heaven. Um, He didn't just leave heaven. He embraced a life of poverty while he was on earth and persecution. Persecution that would lead him to being tortured on a cross. Think about this. We could talk about the disciples who followed Jesus after Jesus came on the scene. Jesus called them, they left their nets, and they followed him. You know, their nets represented their training, represented their livelihood and their future, their complete security. They left it behind in order to follow Jesus. And these same disciples would go on and share in Christ's suffering. Many of them would actually die a martyr's death. Guys, I'm telling you today, these are just a few examples. There are so many examples that I could talk to you about. And I really want to challenge your paradigm. As this pandemic draws to a close, many people, I've noticed, they're they're just continuing to live in fear. And maybe you're one of those people today. I know not everyone faces the same risks. Listen, I get that. But if you've been following the government's guidelines in locking down, you should probably follow them in opening up as well. That seems like a pretty logical response. But even more than that, I want to challenge your paradigm even more today. Here's what I want to tell you. Instead of using your security as a gauge for deciding what to do, use your calling to decide what to do. You see, it's good and it's normal to use our brains, right? Noah and his family, they sent out birds to try to see, you know, if the land was ready. They tested the conditions. That's good. But listen, their exit from the ark was determined by God's calling. He said, come out of the ark. He had a purpose for them to go and refill the earth. If safety, think about it, guys, if safety was the determining factor in these things, no one would ever leave their parents and be joined to a spouse and start their own family. No one would ever do that because it's not a secure secure proposition. It's risky. The world's world's population would still be centered in the plain of Shinar if we never chose freedom and adventure over security. Abraham would never have gone to Canaan. The Israelites would never have left Egypt. Jericho would never have been taken. Think about this stuff, guys. Canaan would never have been settled by the Israelites. David would have never fought Goliath. Paul would have never made his missionary journeys. And oh, by the way, Jesus would never have come to earth. The disciples would never have been martyred. Christians would never have lost their lives under Nero. And when it comes to pandemics, which is what we've been talking about, Christians wouldn't have risked their lives for others, helping them during the the Antonine plague of the second century or the plague of Cyprian in the third century. And in 1527, when the bubonic plague hit Wittenberg, Germany, Martin Luther would have listened to people telling him to flee the city and protect himself. But instead... He stayed and he ministered to the sick because he was living for mission, not for security. Guys, my point is that God's calling on your life is way bigger than your safety. And God's calling to sacrifice our lives for the salvation of other people is a calling that all of us share. It's not just for me, your pastor. It is for all of us. We've all been called to that. Guys, the reason we need to get on with our lives is because we have a mission to accomplish. The Bible says that we are soldiers in a spiritual war that has huge consequences. And if safety was the determining factor, think about it, no soldiers would ever leave home or the safety of their trenches. But we are not here to preserve our lives. We are here to lose them for Jesus' sake. And it's Jesus that taught that, not me. We're here to lose our lives for Jesus' sake. So if your life has only ever been about preserving it so that you can enjoy it the most, then take your time. Take forever. Hide out for the rest of your life if that's what makes you feel safe. 
But if you actually believe that your life serves a purpose in furthering God's kingdom, then I'm suggesting that maybe it's time to step out of the ark. Now listen, that's pretty tough stuff. I hear some of you. You're saying, well, I'm immunocompromised or I have, I have cancer. Like there are, there are some serious things there. I recognize that there are exceptional cases, all right? And I want to be really clear. Let's be very clear. The calling to leave the ark, this metaphor I'm using today, to come out and resume life, it needs to come from God, not from Pastor Bartley, all right? Let's be very clear about that. If leaving your house or being in a public place carries such an immense risk that you are more likely to die, of course, it would be bad stewardship of your life to do such a thing, right? It would make sense to wait a while understandably, and we have been playing that waiting game. But guys, let's be honest, most of us aren't talking about those kinds of odds at this stage, right? We've actually been making elementary age kids in schools wear masks. Guys, do you know how many kids uh, age 0 to 11 in Canada have died because of COVID? 22, 22 since the pandemic started. Guys, that is an insanely small number. In fact, just take a look at this graph for a second that shows how much greater risk there is of young kids dying of different things. Okay, so this is COVID. Flu and pneumonia, just regular flu and pneumonia has a greater risk factor to it. Heart disease, you said, I didn't even know that was a thing for kids. It's not a big thing, but it's greater than the threat of dying of COVID. Drowning. Firearms, this one's motor vehicles. In other words, if we were being consistent, we should be giving our preschoolers flu shots every year. We don't because we know that they're very resilient. We should never let them swim in a pool, right? Because the risk of drowning is at least double what dying of COVID is. And we shouldn't even be driving them around in cars. Guys, think about that. We shouldn't even be driving them around in cars because that's almost six times more deadly. Guys, everything you do in life involves risk assessment. But here's something that you can use. I want you to think about this. Instead of weighing odds, make the matter gods. Instead of weighing odds, make the matter gods. Guys, I've discovered that no amount of empirical data will undo irrational fear. Have you noticed this? So at some point, you just need to make the leap of trusting God with your life. You know, Sarah and I went to Mexico two weeks ago. There's my beautiful bride. We had a wonderful, wonderful time. Um, the day I actually booked the flights to go to Playa del Carmen, I heard that a couple of people were murdered in that same town. And people told me about it. They said, Bartley, you're going there, right? Um, but I looked into it. It was a mafia job, drug dealers, right? Getting uh, revenge on some people that were cutting in on their business. You know, actually, I told the person that told me of this that the same week here in the Toronto area, a number of people died in Scarborough, also gang-related. So kind of pick your poison. Anyway, Sarah and I had a great time away in Mexico. Well, wouldn't you know it, less than one week after returning, one of the beach restaurants where Sarah and I actually hung out and spent at least half a day actually blew up from a gas leak this past week. Um, two people killed and 19 people injured. We literally walked right here and checked in right there. Now, are safety standards in Mexico what they are in Canada? No, probably not. But here's the deal, guys. Hundreds of thousands of people visit Playa del Carmen every year without incident. When I told Sarah about the accident, I, I waited to see, should I actually tell her about this? When I told her about the accident, she looked at me and said, well, I guess it wasn't our time to go yet. I think that's why we get along so well. <laughs> Guys, I have to be honest. Listen, my hope is that I'm never in an accident um, like that, or if I'm ever in an accident like that, that the Lord just takes me home. Because the worst would be to be like totally mangled and survived and then, you know, have everyone visit me in my hospital bed and say, see, Bartley, I told you, Mexico isn't safe. That would be like the worst, okay? But I just want to say, guys, my Bible tells me that my days are already written in God's book. Now, that doesn't mean that I should be reckless with my life or live recklessly, but neither does it mean that I am going to live in fear. God knows my days. There's a great quote from Helen Keller. Take a look. 
She says, security is mostly a superstition. It does not exist in nature, nor do the children of men as a whole experience it. Avoiding danger is no safer in the long run than outright exposure. That's a strong statement. Life is either a daring adventure or nothing. I got thinking about this quote, like how does a blind and deaf woman come to that realization when those of us who see and hear fine can't seem to grasp this? Now guys, if all we've been talking about here is vacations, then this wouldn't be a very significant discussion, right? Do what you want. Like vacation, it's not, we're not talking about any important calling here. But our need for security is much bigger than this. It hinges on much bigger subjects. You see, guys, to be a disciple of Christ requires fearlessness. And a need for security interferes with the mission that Christ has called us to. You know, one of my favorite books that I've ever read, Christian books, is this book called The Faith of Leap by Michael Frost and Alan Hirsch. And there's just an amazing quote in it. Take a look. It says, fear causes a kind of contraction of the heart. As such, it inhibits godly actions such as love and hospitality, risky mission, and generosity. For instance, by imagining some future evil, fear draws us in on ourselves so that we refuse to extend to people or causes that require sacrifice and risk. This, in turn, becomes a direct barrier to Christian discipleship, which calls us not to contract, but to expand, not to limit ourselves to a few things, but to open ourselves lovingly and generously to many things, not to attack that which threatens us, but to love even an enemy. Guys, that's just that's such a great quote. And we have been called, guys, to a mission. We've been called. We need to talk to our neighbors about Jesus. We need to teach our children in our kids and in our teens programs. We need that interaction and that connection. We need to serve people in our community. And we need to interact with the least of these that Jesus taught us that we're here for. We need to invite people into our homes again and into our lives again. People are in desperate need to see our smiles and to feel our hugs. People need to hear the good news about Jesus. Guys, think about this. If you've truly given your life to Christ, if you've truly given your life to him, then it's his to use. Think about what Paul said in Acts chapter 20. He says, but my life is worth nothing to me unless I use it for finishing the work assigned me by the Lord Jesus, the work of telling others the good news about the wonderful grace of God. That's the reason why you have life. That's all it's for, and it's worth nothing more than that, Paul said. Guys, let me wrap it up today just by saying this. I am not the one that you need to listen to when it comes to leaving the ark, of getting back to normal. God is. I said it before, I'll say it again. But I do want to leave you with a challenge here. God has told us not to fear. In fact, it is the most common command that he gives us in the Bible. Do you know that? He understands our fallen condition very well. It's fear not. Over and over again, God says, fear not. And it's clear, guys, that our decisions need to be driven by our purpose, the God-given purpose that we have, not by our own security. So I want to leave you with this challenge. Here it is. Tell God that you're going to exit the ark for the purpose of doing his work and that you trust him to take care of you. Guys, I just believe that if you're living your life for this, for the purpose that God gave you, that you can trust him with your life. You can trust him with your health and your safety. Pray that prayer and ask God to give you peace. And I think you will find the courage to do lesson number one from a global disaster exit the ark. Join us again next Sunday in person. It would be awesome. We're going to talk about the second lesson, which is build an altar. We'll see you then. In the darkness we were without light till from heaven you came running there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets to a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt
Give 110 percent. That's impossible. No, no one can give more than 100 percent. By definition, that is the most anyone can give. But because with Jesus I can accomplish the mathematically impossible, we can give 110 percent. Right, Elizabeth? Exactly. Yeah. We can do anything with the help of Jesus. <laughs> So this is a reminder that the theme of this year is the 110% uh, slogan, campaign, motto, because we are giving 110% right. in four different areas. Yes. Collaboration. Yep. Which is serving. Communion. Communion with God. Yep. Contribution. Contribution financially, and then there was also community, I think, or connection. But it's about connection, connection connecting yes. with your community. An extra C for a bonus. So okay. thank you to everyone who has been stepping up, giving 110% in all of the different areas. And if you uh, are not familiar with this campaign or realize, yes, I never filled in my commitment form, lots of C words then uh, on the Church Center app, on the website, you can find the 110% logo, you can find the form, 
fill it out, let us know in which area. You can even just pick one of the areas that you, you will be giving 110%. And then you get the 110% gift package. Woo -woo. Yes. Yes, and if you want to know more about different ways in which you can give financially, you can go to renewchurch.ca slash give, or you can also find more information about that on the Church Center app, where we have lots of good stuff, but you can find out about giving financially as well. Yes, excellent. Yeah, definitely download the app because yeah. so much information is there. And thank you to Pastor Bartley for an amazing message today. Yeah. Uh, I'm really looking forward to this entire series and tying into today's message. It's, you know, about overcoming fear is a, a lot of what we're talking about. So if we're not friends on the Bible app yet, I'd like to be your friend in real life too, <laughs> but please friend me on the Bible app. There should be instructions on the screen. Um, you can find me and we do devotionals together uh, as a church family. And this week we're going to be focusing on a devotional about overcoming fear. So please join in with us on that. And next Sunday, Pastor Bartley will be continuing on in this new series. Wonderful. And the theme for next week is going to be build an altar. Mm. So of course we hope that you will tune in and learn more about that. Yes, or hopefully we'll see them in person. Oh, and even yes. there's still time today to come in person. So it's reunion Sunday today. If you can come on out, come say hi, even if it's just for the free pizza afterwards, come around like 5.20, 5.30. We would okay, love to see them, you. Don't tell them just about that. <laughs> they should come well, no. at 4 p.m. That would be better. To Hope Church. Or 3.30 for coffee. There's coffee and tea. That is true. Yes. Right. Coffee is back. Ooh, ooh. This is very important to people like Elizabeth who love coffee. That's right. People like me who like tea. There you go. There you go. Yeah, so come for tea, hearing the message again, and, uh, and pizza. Reunion Sunday so we can fellowship together. Look forward to seeing you. Mm -hmm.